Okay, we have a great crowd today. Um, so let's get started. So welcome to the last uh, colloquium of the quarter. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome one of our own today, Professor Manuel Andres. Um, a quick bio um, for Manuel. Uh, Manuel got his PhD in 2013, um, working in the group of uh, Professor Emanuel Bloch at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics and the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Now, one of the pioneering accomplishments uh, Manuel made during his PhD was the development of the so-called quantum gas microscope, which enabled imaging of individual atoms within ensembles trapped in optical lattices for the first time, um, which really allowed um, unprecedented access to information about particle correlations between different sites in the lattice. Uh, between 2013 and 14, he stayed at the Max Planck, but he decided to pivot into theory temporarily at least by working as a postdoc in a theoretical group of Professor Ignacio Sirac. Um, in 2014, um, Harvard leered Manuel uh, across the pond with a prize postdoctoral fellowship where he worked in the group of Professor Misha Lukin. And there he was involved in yet another pioneering feat, uh, namely the realization of the so-called tweezer array. Um, this is a platform where one assembles chains of alkali atoms trapped by optical tweezers into regular arrays that can be um, fully quantum entangled and then individually addressed and, and also controlled. Um, so in the short few years since he began his assistant professorship at Caltech in 2016, uh, Manuel has created yet another splash in the physics community um, by realizing a new version of the tweezer array um, where he uses alkaline earth atoms as opposed to alkali atoms uh, whose potential um, he's gonna to describe today. So um, lastly, let me note that despite his young age, Manuel has garnered a long list of accomplishments uh, that have been recognized by many awards, um, but most recent of which all lists includes um, the Sloan Research Fellowship and NSF Career Award and the AFOSR Young Investigator Award. Um, so Manuel, uh, we're eagerly awaiting your talk, so please take it away. Thanks so much for the nice introduction, Dave. Thanks everyone for coming and uh, tuning in. Let me share my screen. Alrighty, I hope you can see everything. Let's see. All right. Okay. So I hope this is visible. Okay. Thanks again um, for the intro and, and thanks for coming. So I'll tell you about the story um, that Dave described concisely already, which is that we now can control individual atoms with uh, reconfigurable tweezer arrays for applications in, in quantum science. And now I'll first review some of the developments and then uh, I'll talk about um, specific results at Caltech from the past years and some of them very, very recent. Um, so let me start very broadly with um, defining what I mean with quantum science. Experimentally speaking, it has a very wide range of systems um, from traditional solid state materials, uh, qubits defined in the solid state, uh, photonic and phononic systems, and then specifically we work with cold atomic systems and there's a wide variety of platforms, but there's a sort of a set of common goals you can define. And um, this, this set of common goals um, starts for most of us, at least with the ones that like work on the atomic side with quantum computing and quantum simulation. So quantum computing is building a, a, you know, a, a computer that utilizes quantum properties uh, to our advantage. Um, and again, so variant of this in a way is, is what we call quantum simulation, which is to study a many body physics in, in highly engineered bottom up fashion so to, learn, to learn something new. Um, third, we're interested in um, what's sometimes called quantum metrology, which is to use quantum states or systems for precision measurement. As is a long tradition in atomic physics, of course. Um, and uh, one important question there is if you can utilize quantum properties to really improve the precision of, of these measurements. And uh, fourth, we're interested in linking up the systems in, in quantum networks and distributed quantum networks. Um, so for many of these, it's really uh, a question of trying to outperform their classical conduct counterparts. They want to do a computation that uh, utilizes quantum properties in a way such that they gain an advantage. And um, the key ingredient um, in, in simplified terms is what I would call large scale entanglement. And then this key ingredient is also the key challenge in a way. And I wanna explain this um, in, in some sort of a pictorial fashion. You can imagine a set of qubits. Uh, these are two level systems. And uh, you try to basically um, start from a system 
is not entangled, so it's what we call a product state of all of the qubits in their ground state. And then you try to build up entanglement in a systematic fashion. So you can imagine basically entangling maybe two qubits and then trying to grow an entangled state, which is a more and more a complex superposition of, of quantum states it's kind of from the scratch. And then and when you do that and you think about it a little bit more carefully, and um, if you only have local interactions, which is typically the case, then um, this this growth of entanglement has, has roughly speaking a light cone uh, fashion. So that means if I uh, wanna uh, generate a large scale entangled system, um, it will take me longer time to do that in a larger system. Okay, so that's one thing that's very important. And at the same time, um, if I have a larger scale system, uh, my uh, probability to make an error also grows with system size. So whenever I have a qubit here, there could be a decoherence event or some coupling to the environment that would destroy this fragile uh, entanglement. So this is really the first challenge, which I think is one of the most fundamental ones, is really the, the kind of competition between entanglement growth and the time you need for entanglement growth, which actually is larger and larger systems, and, and uh, decoherence, which is coupling to the environment, which is also the larger your system, the stronger the coupling. So this is somehow makes it twice as hard to, to actually reach states of large scale entanglement. And the other one is on a technical level, if I wanna do that, um, I have a competition, some sort of scalability versus controllability. If you think of a solid state material, it has a, like, a very large number of, of electrons in it, for example, or even ultra cold atoms already years ago had 20 million atoms in them, but I could not control them individually. Now um, there's other systems that come more from a side of like individual controllability, but it's hard to actually build them up. So this is another challenge that is uh, uh, technical and sometimes also fundamental. And now, um, most of what I will be talking about is um, how we can address these challenges using, you know, new techniques for individually controlling neutral atoms. Okay. Um, so here's a, a brief outline. So the tool of the trade for what I'll be talking about is so-called tweezer arrays. So I'll introduce that. Um, I'll talk about rootback interactions, which is our preferred choice for introducing entanglement, and I'll introduce how it works and the limits. And, and they'll go briefly over um, some of the uh, earlier results in, uh, at Caltech, uh, uh, where we now trap alkaline earth atoms and tweezer arrays. And I'll talk about narrow line cooling, fidelity, high fidelity imaging, and how we can entangle them. And then I will uh, briefly describe some very recent uh, results uh, in terms of uh, benchmarking um, a quantum simulator built uh, by Rootback atoms. And uh, in the course of this benchmarking work, we also found a relatively fundamental uh, phenomena that we call emergent randomness uh, that I will talk about. It's a, it's a new um, phenomenon in the context of quantum thermalization and quantum chaos, actually. And then at the very end, I will zoom out one more time and talk about um, how we can use these systems uh, potentially for uh, quantum enhanced metrology, specifically quantum enhanced uh, optical clocks. Okay, let me get started with um, Acknowledging uh, people who did the work. I mean, here's really the my group members, current group members, and, and former group members um, who really did the hard work in the lab. Uh, some of them moved on already to their own uh, positions. Um, we had a, a collaboration, we still have a collaboration with, uh, with a JPL group uh, to establish uh, ultra narrow clock lasers in, in our group. And then we have uh, various theory collaborators uh, for, for different projects. Um, and for some of the work uh, I'll show, we actually collaborated with uh, someone Choi pretty pretty closely, and then also Caltech crowd, um, Robert from John's group and, and Fernando. Um, and also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, funding from various sources, uh, um, to public and private and from Caltech and so on. Okay, let me get let me get going. So um, what, what are optical tweezers? Optical tweezers is nothing else than a very tightly focused laser beam uh, that you generate basically with a high resolution objective. And now if you stick this laser beam into a cloud of cold atoms, um, periodically you will trap a single atom. And, and this has been first seen around 2001 already with a single, with a single tweezer. So what we are working on now is a large scale tweezer arrays. There are multiple techniques to generate them. Uh, one is spatial light modulators. Uh, what we are using uh, often is a combination or like one important piece of technique, I would say, is acoustic optical deflectors, which is an alternative way of doing it. And um, these acoustic optical deflectors work relatively uh, simple. Um, you shine in a laser beam and then uh, they get basically uh, deflected 
in in a in a in a crystal, and the, the deflection comes from a traveling RF wave that basically goes through the crystal, and then the deflection angle depends on the RF frequency, and then if I basically shine in multiple RF frequencies, I get multiple beams out that I can control individually with uh, one frequency in the RF each. So if I switch off that frequency, I can switch off the beam. If I move the frequency, I can move the beams around. And if I cross AODs, then I can generate large-scale 2D arrays. So here's a picture um, taking a Caltech of uh, 10,000 empty tweezers. So this is just a light field. So you see this can actually get uh, quite large just in, like, from the optical technique uh, point of view. Uh, the, the challenge is, however, how to fill them. So let me uh, show this here. So um, this is now a, a series of shots that is generated by repeatedly basically sticking a tweezer array into a cold atomic cloud. Then you try to pick up atoms, you let the cloud disperse, and then you take a fluorescence image of the atoms. I'll show you later how the fluorescence image is working. And then you repeat the whole thing. So you again stick the tweezer array into the cloud, you let the cloud disperse and take an image. And this is basically this kind of video here. So you see single shots. And then the challenge is uh, that in each individual shots, you see a stochastic loading process. So each tweezer is either empty or with one or filled with one atom. So you can average this and it looks like a nice average image. But of course, I want a defect free array, say to build a quantum computer, do like some concrete um, solid state simula simulation uh, in each shot. And that's really the question how can we generate large scale defect free arrays? And um, so the technique to solve this problem, at least partially, is called atom by atom assembly. And it's um, relatively simple on, on first lens technical implementation, it's non trivial. But what you do is you, you stick an array into a cloud of atoms, you try to pick up single atoms, you take an image. And then in this image, you identify empty traps and using this RF control techniques that I showed you earlier, you can basically switch off the empty traps and then you can rearrange all the full traps into a defect free atomic array. So this is at least the theory and practice. This is how it looks like. So here's a video of before and after images. So this is a 1D array that's stochastically filled. And then we're taking an image and then we're sorting it to the left and then we're repeating the whole process. So every time you see a this different stochastic pattern and after the sorting process um, with a very high likelihood, you see a defect free array uh, sorted to the left. You can vary the geometry of this process, the, the end product by changing different RF frequency or changing the SLM uh, configuration, basically shot by shot. So you can basically dial in different atomic configurations um, uh, to your liking. Um, by now, this technique is used by a few groups, um, originally developed um, as part of my postdoc at, at Harvard and then back to back with Andouan's group in, in Paris. And there's a few other groups who do that, including ourselves at Caltech now. Um, so roughly speaking, the specs are you can arrange defect free arrays of 50 atoms. Now there's also you know, a little bit more than 100. Um, in 1D, 2D, and, and quasi 3D, quasi 3D means like uh, multiple layers, but the extension in the third direction is not as deep. Uh, the atomic distances are typically adjustable from a micrometer to 100 micrometers. I can just do this with a press of a button. Um, again, I can do flexible geo range area geometries. And the repetition rate is a lot faster than traditional cold atom experiments, I should say. So usually in cold atom experiments, you have to do a technique that's evaporative cooling, which is in a sense a self assembly. Uh, what we do, we don't do self assembly. We actually um, assemble things in a um, in a, in a controlled fashion. Now that's actually quite a bit faster. Um, there's also limits. Of course, so the first limit is the number of traps you can make. I showed you an image with um, 10,000 tweezers. As always, it's hard to make that many traps that are actually deep enough um, to, to trap atoms. So there's a laser power limitation. And then the total success probability of really this process scales also exponential in a way. So um, if I really want an array where I have no defects in the end, I am not allowed to make a single mistake, right? And every imaging process, I could make a mistake or in every move, I can make a mistake. So the total success probability of getting a defect array scales with P to the N, where P is the single atom rearrangement success probability. Okay, so that's some sort of a limitation. I'll come back to this uh, later. Um, again, if you have questions, uh, it's, it's you know, just raise your hand. I think Kobe will, will catch you. Um, so at this stage, these are neutral atoms, neutral atoms in the electronic routes that they're trapped in, in these tweezers, and their typical distances are not closer than, than a micrometer. So at these distances, they basically don't interact. So there's no um, like sizable long range forces. And uh, to now engineer entanglement, we need interactions on top of that. So and there's multiple ways of doing this. Our choice is uh, to introduce dipole dipole interactions by going to Rydberg states, and I'll introduce this in detail in a minute. There's other um, opportunities. 
Uh, one is to use molecules that are dipolar. There's recent progress in this direction. Kanku Lee's group, for example, at Harvard. Um, uh, that's another option for long range dipolar interactions. You could also, I think, of photo mediated actions, uh, interactions um, by, by coupling atoms to, to cavities. Um, here I'm showing an example of the photonic crystal cavity, similar to what Chef does in his lab. And um, also, there have been experiments where, where um, you can basically let atoms tunnel from tweezer to tweezer to realize Hubbard type uh, interactions. I won't talk about these, I'll stick to um, Rydberg interactions now. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in detail. Um, any questions about this so far? Okay. Then let's let me let me move forward. So, how do Rydberg interactions uh, work? Uh, let me start with what are Rydberg. Oh, uh, we do have one question. Oh yeah, sure, please. Let's make it a little interactive if possible. Um, I, I just had a question of uh, for the tweezer array. What particular atom are we using? Uh, and if we've ever so far electrons. So can you could you say the last part again? Sorry about that. Just uh, what atom are we using, and if we've ever tried just single leaning on a, on an electron in particular? Single leaning on an electron. Okay, so the atoms I haven't specified yet. I talk about which atoms. So, uh, the results I've shown so far are um, uh, with alkali atoms. Um, this is rubidium. This is rubidium. This is cesium. I think this is rubidium. Oh, okay. So it's usually rubidium or cesium, and I'll talk about different types of atoms in a minute. Thank and you. I did still not understand the last part with electrons. Oh, I, I it's just I read a paper from UC Berkeley where they tried moving from just an atom and try to do a single electron trap. Uh, I was just oh, wondering. Oh, this is Hartmut Hefner's work. Yeah, this is a little bit more complex, and I'm not sure if this is so easy just with a um, with a more optical trap. Oh. Um, we also have some ideas in this direction, but that's like this work I'm talking about here is not about electrons. That's a lot. Completely different story. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so these are these are usually um, alkali atoms, actually. These these pictures. All right. Okay, good. Let me let me move forward then, um, and introduce Rydberg interactions. So, what are Rydberg atoms to start with? Um, Generically, if I do these, these experiments, I have an atom that is close to its electronic ground state, and then and the electron wave function is actually quite small. Now, Rydberg atoms are highly excited atoms where I go to very high principal quantum numbers. That just means I basically excite to states that have a very large electronic uh, outer wave function. So this is the wave function of the of the valence of one of the valence electrons in, in general. And this wave function can can be quite sizable. So it can be up to 200 nanometers, and that's a, or even larger. And that's a very large length scale on on uh, atomic physics experiments. And as a consequence, because this uh, electronic wave function is so large, it's very easy to polarize it. So a tiny electric field will basically generate a dipole. And because of this um, high polarizability, you end up with very strong so-called induced dipole-dipole di uh, interactions in the Rydberg state. So these are sometimes called van der Waals interaction. And um, this induced dipole-dipole interactions is a second order effect um, and it scales with a uh, distance scaling of one to, the, uh, one to the power of R to the six. So it has a uh, induced dipole-dipole interaction scaling. Then interestingly enough, the, the prefactor um, for this scales with n to the 11, where n is the principal quantum number uh, in, in, in the atom. So it's extremely strong scaling um, in terms of the um, overall strengths. And then if you plug in numbers here um, that are kind of typical, if you go to say n equals 70, uh, and you dial in the tweezer array to a distance of two micrometers, you have an interaction shift of 10 gigahertz, which is really uh, extremely large uh, for thermic physics uh, uh, scales. And then you can essentially change that interaction shift by order of magnitudes by just uh, moving tweezers to different, to different uh, distances. And in simplified terms, the interactions you can reach with Rydberg atoms are very well suited to the typical atomic distances. So at these distances that we have here, we can generate interactions that are extremely strong, or we could even switch them off by just going to larger distances. Now, um, if you look at this uh, in a little bit more detail, so what we do here is we basically have this array of atoms. And then how do we excite the Rydberg states? Well, um, we start in the ground state, and then in very simplified terms, I'll expand a little bit on how this works in practice later, but in very simplified terms, you just shine in laser light that couples a ground state to a Rydberg state. And this is done um, using specific wavelengths. And um, so you can basically then control the coupling strings from ground to Rydberg uh, with a laser intensity, and this laser intensity maps to a so-called Rabi frequency, or bigger, okay? Um, now, um, 
this is some sort of a picture of, of a non-interacting atom. So what happens with interaction? So if I have two atoms that are close by, and um, if I look at the level structure now, I have um, four states. I have can both atoms can be in the ground state, one can be excited, the other one can be excited, or both can be excited. Now this rootback rootback interaction um, uh, is only sizable when both atoms are excited. So you get this one over R6 shift when both atoms are in the in the rootback state. And now you can control how, start, how strong that is basically by changing the distance of some sort of the track. And um, more precisely, um, you typically shine in this, this, this laser with the tuning with respect to the atomic frequency, and then you can build up uh, a more or less a many body Hamiltonian here by mapping uh, the system to, to uh, Pauli operators and to a spin system. So I'm introducing the sigma C, sigma X operators. And then um, if you look at this whole array, if it's illuminated with this ripback excitation, you get first of all a single atom term it just describes coupling from the ground to the rootback state. There's a detuning term in here, and this is all in a rotating frame already. And then if you include interactions, you get an interaction term in here, where again, this coupling matrix here, I can basically tune by changing the spacing. This is the so-called typical rootback array Hamiltonian. And this is, I should say, the simplest form. There's um, different ways of engineering this, where you can get hopping terms and whatnot. So I'm going to stick mostly to the physics of this. I don't want to explain the other ways. Now, um, questions about that? I'll talk a little bit about applications in a second. Okay, so this type of engineering of interactions has been used um, in the past years uh, pretty broadly as so some sort of a, a almost like an explosion of, 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 of results. Um, most of the results are in what I would call many body physics or quantum simulation. So you can know, use this in a very uh, engineered fashion, in a very controlled fashion to study many body phenomena um, from a bottom up uh, perspective. So uh, a lot of results are in what I would call quantum magnetism. These are transitions from a disorder to order uh, uh, magnetic phases, including really studying the properties of quantum phase transitions. I mean, some of these I, I was part of. I'll, um, I can point you to a very good review if you're interested by Antoine Brovis that just came out in, in Nature Physics. It has really described some of the things in detail. Um, another interesting direction in many body physics here is really quantum dynamics, really out of equilibrium dynamics. Um, there, there was already a surprise, um, so-called many body scars. That's a very specific phenomena where things don't thermalize as quickly as you think. Uh, this has been found in, 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 in the systems and has, has led to a lot of follow-up work. Um, there's very early work in, in the direction of topological physics. Um, in particular, there's one result from, from the Paris group on, on engineering so-called symmetry protect, uh, protected topological phases in 1D and controlling edge states, for example, very precisely. Um, I should say there's a lot of open ground um, based on what has been proposed or what we locally work on at Caltech. So, for example, we have a collaboration with uh, Jason Alicea and co uh, on, on, on thinking about how to realize spin liquids in 2D. Um, we have very concrete ideas how to realize um, actually um, boundary conformal field theories in there. There's proposals for lattice gauge theories and so on. Uh, later on, talk a little bit about some very recent results that we have in, 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 in quantum chaos. Um, so this is the kind of many body quantum simulation side of things. Um, there's a, a, a few more results, uh, more in the direction of quantum computing or what I would call entangled state engineering. Um, so two qubit gates have been realized there or two qubit entanglement has been shown. And typically the fidelities um, before uh, our work at Caltech were around 97%, um, and then you can distinguish entanglement that's in long-lived states and the so-called hyperfine states, or entanglement that's in this ground to rootback transition that I just showed you previously. Uh, another, I think, pretty important and pretty interesting result is that um, you can make large-scale GHC states. So GHC states are uh, microscopic superpositions. This is shown here, for example, down here. So this would be a superposition of an antiferromagnetic state like this with the opposite parity state like that. And these GHG states have been shown with up to uh, sizes of 20 qubits, which is a record across all quantum science platforms. I think there's some superconducting qubits uh, platforms that maybe have reached 20 qubits by now too. And um, this one, this is a work I'm, I'm relatively proud of because this adiabatic preparation scheme that we used there uh, back at the time was kind of like a, uh, almost like a, a dream I had at night when I woke up. So this is kind of like a, a, a nice story, but it tells you that in a sense, these, these tweezer arrays already in, in their very early stage um, in terms of really trying to program or engineer large scale entanglement 
uh, have have reached very competitive values, despite the fact that if you just think about gates, maybe the fidelities are not 100%, say, uh, on par with superconducting qubits or ions. Okay. Um, so this is the good side. There's, of course, uh, also a bad side. Before I move to the bad side, let me say there has been remarkable experimental progress, but I would say we have only seen uh, the tip of the iceberg right, in terms of the applications. So now the bad side. So the bad side is there's, of course, limitations to this whole story. And uh, one limitation is uh, the Rootback lifetime that sets a fundamental limit on, on the coherence time that you have. So you have about 100 microseconds to do these experiments before you get spontaneous emission, essentially. In alkali atoms, this is the rubidium and cesium results that I showed so far. Um, typically, this lifetime is reduced further by the fact that you have to go via two photon transition into this Rootback state and you get intermediate state scattering. Additionally, um, atoms can move in the tweezers and this can lead to Doppler shifts and you can have laser noise on top. So this all adds up into some limitations on coherence time. There's an additional time scale. I don't want to go into too much detail in which is a so-called trap off time. So often for these experiments, we actually switch off the tweezer traps and do them kind of free flight very, very quickly because these um, Rittberg interactions are so fast. And the reason for that is that typically these Rittberg states are very strongly anti-trapped and we want to avoid these kind of shifts. Um, and typically, this is maybe up to 20 microseconds if you do it, right? There's further limitations. And these limitations you have to compare um, to the achievable Rabi frequency, which is the lowest energy scale in this Hamiltonian. So you cannot do anything faster than this, than this frequency, typically. And this sets some sort of a scale for how many operations I can do, actually, in the system. Additionally, a system size limitation. And also, um, until, until recently, the detection fidelity for Rittberg states has been actually pretty low, it has been only at 98%, which for certain many body phenomena and for gate operations and actually debugging things has been a problem. Um, okay. All right, so, so at Caltech, we, we start, okay, so can we, you know, improve on this uh, maybe by utilizing um, a different atom and, and some sort of the peculiarities of uh, atomic structure in different atoms, the so-called alkaline earth atoms. And if we did that, maybe we could even find uh, qualitatively different applications. And this is this is uh, really then the work that we did at Caltech here. Um, so what are alkaline earth atoms? Alkaline earth atoms are atoms with two valence electrons and they live in the same second column of the uh, periodic table. And specifically we use uh, strontium-88. So these atoms uh, play an important role in atomic physics, uh, mostly because they're used in optical atomic clocks. And uh, in, in particular, the um, most stable atomic clocks are actually based on uh, using strontium atoms in, in optical lattices. Uh, and the reason is um, that these, these atoms have so-called dipole forbidden transitions and that these are optical transitions that are extremely narrow. So this is a, what is called the intercombination line here that we use for cooling. It's a seven kilohertz line width, and this you have to compare to typical line widths in alkali atoms that are uh, multiple megahertz. And then in addition, there's an extremely narrow transition, the so-called Krog transition, which has uh, uh, like a line width that, that's, that's extremely narrow. And usually this clock transition then is used to define an optical clock standard in, in an optical lattice. Yeah, now our goal was, yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, uh, this is Sri Kulkarni. I thought the original clocks and frequency stands were rubidium, then shifted to cesium. In fact, cesium defines the, the yeah, yeah, second. So I was not aware that that's, that the next group over has taken over timekeeping. Yeah, okay, I, mean, I should be more precise. I should be more precise. So the, the frequency standard nowadays is still defined via hyperfine transitions in cesium. And however, if you just think about clock stability, uh, this is this is like you know, um, and then the most stable clocks are actually run by optical transitions in in uh, using many atoms trapped in an optical lattice. Um, there's a goal to redefine uh, frequency standard by by these optical transitions, but this has not been implemented yet. So, uh, but in terms of purely st strontium clocks, is there an equivalent? to a rubidium or the cesium clock for strontium? Yeah, yeah there's, there's a cesium clock. The, the difference is like to be clear. So in, in here, these transitions are um, in the optical machine. So it's really, this is what makes the stability. I see. So the, I quali see. the quality factor you can have on this transition is much okay. higher than what you have on, a, so that's the, 
Yeah, so the quality factor you can have is I see. So much you're higher than for a hyperfine transition. That's yeah. really the so you're going from a radio to optical with the storm. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's yeah. It. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I did not do that, I should say. Of course, there's uh, people like Chun, Chun Yi who really pioneered this. Yeah. And, and yeah. No, Jeff has a very important paper in that, in that regime. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I was not aware of this. Yeah. So, so what we do now is like, is somehow, in, in a way, our approach at Catholic is to merge a lot of these techniques that have been developed in, in this optical clock field uh, with single atom control techniques. Uh, it's some sort of a, almost like a high precision approach uh, to this to this tweezer array physics that we started. And then, um, so there was some, some previous work in, in controlling individual or like at least imaging individual alkaline earth atoms. And specifically, there's one result from Japanese groups uh, for quantum gas microscopes that they've talked about uh, with the terpium, but really controlling at atoms individual and imaging, uh, which strontium, for example, didn't exist. And then even for terpium atoms, there was no single atom controlling lattices. So we really um, had to pioneer these things kind of from scratch and, and reinvent a lot of the techniques. Um, and there's parallel work before I go into what we did uh, in, in, in two other groups in the US, one at Chiller in Adam Kaufman's group and one at Princeton in Jeff Thompson groups. And some of the results I show have some sort of a mirror image, back-to-back uh, -back image in, in, in their group. So we really established this as a, as a platform here at Caltech. Um, and um, with various steps, I'll, I'll talk about some of these in detail. Um, so we, we showed the first imaging and narrow line cooling in, in tweezer arrays of alkaline earth atoms. And then we showed like a record for basically high fidelity imaging. Um, we implemented Rydberg excitations on top of that for the first time with alkaline earth atoms. And then we also merged actually this um, uh, tweezer array platform uh, with basically optical clock excitations. I should say that we um, we were not completely the first one here. So Adam was, beat us a little bit to that, but this, this whole tweezer array clock story actually builds on imaging techniques uh, somewhat developed in this PIL from 2019 from us. Um, let me walk you through these results at least briefly um, before I talk more about Rootback um, and, and actually many body physics that we implemented with Rootback recently. So let me very briefly um, go over this imaging and, and, and cooling results. So and I think it's, it's, it's important to understand this because these, these narrow lines now enable a, a much more precise control over the emotional degree uh, of the atoms. So these, these tweezer arrays are trapped for the atoms and then on the bottom of the trap, basically atoms can oscillate around and they essentially form a, a quantum harmonic oscillator. And then if I just load atoms into these tweezers, they're actually quite hot. And, and the temperature is a problem for uh, basically the coherence uh, of, of gates or quantum simulation that I want to do. But because of that, we really want to cool as much as we can. And here, we can utilize the fact that these um, uh, optical transitions are extremely narrow. In particular, the seven kilohertz line comes in handy. It was one of the reasons why we picked strontium. Um, so what you see is if you look at these motional levels of the atoms in the trap, the spacing here is around 100 kilohertz, at least in the tight direction. And then the seven kilohertz is actually narrower than that spacing. That means you can actually resolve basically this motional degrees of freedom optically. And because you can resolve them, you can actually utilize this and do sideband cooling. So you just excite from one motional state on a red sideband to a motional state with one quanta less. And then the excitation brings you back to zero in very simplified terms. Um, we see the sideband cooling spectra, you know, and we saw them for the first time at, at this uh, 2019 time or 2018. And then in the sideband spectra, you see that the red sideband is strongly suppressed. And that means that you are very close to the motional ground state already. Okay, so this was a, some sort of a demonstration of close to ground state cooling. Um, at this time, we also found new cooling mechanism um, that were like predicted in, in theory, if you talk into papers from 1994 or so, but have probably never been seen experiment. And we somehow uh, stumbled across them. Um, we're not looking for them actually, but they turned out to be extremely practical. Um, and they have to do with the fact that again, this narrow line is so narrow that you can resolve basically the shape of the trap completely. That means you can excite atoms locally, say when they're only on the bad end of the trap. So an atom can roll down, is excited, and then it rolls up, for example, a steeper hill and gets de-excited. It's a so-called Sisyphus cooling that you can realize here almost in a textbook fashion with these narrow lines. And by now, this Sisyphus cooling mechanism is what we use basically throughout in our work. In any case, so this, this basically, these cooling mechanisms that we found here, they show that you can have a very robust and simple ways of controlling basically the emotional degrees of freedom in these tweezers now. And that's a, a real advantage of, of working with uh, alkaline earth atoms. And again, um, getting atoms to, to cool temperatures is important for root coherence later on. 
It matters for imaging fidelity. It matters later on for this clock line control. So that's actually pretty important for us. Let me talk about um, let me talk about imaging. Um, so how do we image atoms here? So what we do is we shine in light on this broad 30 megahertz transition. So that's a blue transition. So you shine in light and then you observe scattered fluorescence photons on a through a high resolution objective on an EMCCD camera. So, um, so in principle, you could just try to do that. What would happen is that during this fluorescence imaging, atoms would heat up, they get recall photons, that they heat out of the trap and you lose them pretty quickly. And this hampers your uh, imaging fidelity. To prevent that, you cool at the same time. So what we basically do is we shine in um, light for fluorescence imaging and at the same time cool on the seven kilohertz line, actually with the physical cooling mechanism that I just showed you. Um, using this scheme and observing these blue photons, we see images like that. So this is a typical single shot image. You already see this looks like pretty good signal to noise. Um, you can then count photons um, in these boxes um, where you expect an atom and then you see different peaks. So for example, you can distinguish a peak between uh, where you have um, no atom and then there's a one atom peak and then maybe you would expect a, a two atom peak, but we don't see that. And that's because of so-called light assisted collision. So typically these tweezers have only one or zero atoms. Now, how, how large is the imaging fidelity? That depends on how well you can resolve these two peaks. And in our case, this resolution is extremely good. So we find imaging fidelities of close to four nines or even above four nines, uh, which is I think still a record in for neutral atom imaging in general, not just for alkaline earth atoms, but for all species and for all platforms, I believe. We find um, also very high fidelities for, of survival. That means like if I image an atom, I still have it afterwards. And the key to success there is somewhat um, um, long lifetimes in the trap. Now with this visa arrays, we have lifetimes in our lab of close to 10 minutes, which is um, more than an order of magnitude actually larger um, than, than has been achieved before. So these things are pretty important. Um, for large scale assembly, as I told you earlier, so this assembly process, if I want to make one mistake, I'm kind of out. So I'm not allowed to make a mistake. And in particular, I'm not allowed to make a mistake already at the imaging stage. So um, having such high fidelities will in the future enable us to go to larger arrays. So that's one thing. It's also important um, for debugging um, quantum operations if I can uh, image things with very, very high fidelity to make it to high fidelity case, for example. Okay. Um, that is that. Questions about the schooling and imaging before I move to Ripback? Okay, good. So we have basically with these with these early papers where we showed uh, first imaging and then extremely high fidelity image and cooling, we kind of established these tweezer arrays as a platform for single atom control for alkaline earth atoms, basically. Uh, in parallel, mainly with with Adam and and, and Jeff. And now um, the question was, okay, so so what about really engineering interactions on top? And and again, our like interaction mechanism of choice is Rydberg. And um, then we started out, okay, to engineer a, basically a Rydberg pathway, and how do we do this in practice? And then um, this was one of the reasons um, why we picked strontium and alkaline earth atoms in the first place is that. There's a novel way of engineering Rydberg interactions in alkaline earth atoms. And this novel way makes use of the fact that there's a metastable state associated really with this optical clock transition. So again, this optical clock transition is extremely narrow. That means the excited state there is extremely long lived. So now what we do is atoms originally start out in this um, absolute ground state, and then we basically transfer them um, transfer them to this metastable state. Yeah, and this metastable state lives like forever, essentially on the time scale that we need to uh, really perform this quantum experiments that we're interested in. And then we can basically forget about this guy. Okay, then the, the advantage now is that I'm already a little bit excited and I can go with a single photon transition in an extremely clean excitation pathway uh, to a Rydberg state of interest. And um, so this configuration we use throughout and it has a lot of interesting features. So one is that you can go to very large Rabi frequencies. Uh, that means you can basically beat, just by doing things faster, you can beat at the coherence time scales uh, in, a, in a better way. Um, you have no extra decoherence from intermediate states. So in a sense, if you think about, if you think back, um, think back at this uh, schema short for alkali atoms, we basically kind of um, substitute this two photon excitation process with a stepwise two photon excitation process. We, we kind of basically skip the first step. And because of this, you have no extra decoherence from these intermediate states. Atoms are very cold, as I showed you already. So we're very close to the ground state that suppresses any, any noise that comes from atomic motion. Uh, then we also, I don't have enough time to show this. We also showed uh, a new 
detection scheme for rootback states uh, using auto ionization, um, really improving the detection infidelity by orders of magnitude in terms of how well can I actually distinguish this R from G state. And this detection scheme also has to do basically with this two electron um, level steam and utilizing this in the right way. And then also last but not least, this rootback states uh, in principle in, in alkaline earth atoms are actually trappable using um, ionic transitions of the core. Okay, so there's some sort of main features that were very attractive to us in the beginning, and this was one of the main reasons, in addition to the ferro line cooling, uh, that that I wanted to go with Stromsen and try this out. Okay, so here are some uh, results that we um, published uh, last year around that time. Um, so so we did this this excitation scheme, and then the first thing we tried is okay, we place atoms at a very large distance such that they don't interact, and we just want to see how well we can actually drive that transition. So we drive that transition in a non-interacting case essentially at large distances with a on resonance basically with this laser. And then what you see is almost textbook Rabi oscillations. So you see basically this excitation probability from from this state to this state goes from one to zero and oscillates really with a textbook Rabi with a very high contrast. I should say all this data that I'm showing here is like not post-processed. So this is basically raw data, not taking into account preparation infidelities or infidelities from, um, uh, from detection. So this is this is nice to see. You can also drive this for a longer time and you see up to maybe 40, 50 oscillations here. So this is also nice. And these results were really the first time you know, we managed to to engineer Rydberg uh, excitation with, with individual alkaline earth atoms. You see very high Rabi frequencies up to you know, 10, 15, 20 megahertz if you want to. Um, the fidelities here, if you look a little bit closer, are in the 99.5 regime uh, without correcting for detection and preparation errors, actually. We see about 40, 40 oscillations. And, and at the time, and probably up to now, these are still some sort of records for um, the quality in which you can excite to these Rydberg states, basically. Um, what about what about interaction? So we can engineer. In question yeah. from the line. Uh, yeah, uh, I I was wondering what limits uh, your Rabi frequency. Uh, laser power. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we'd like to have more laser power. Actually, the laser we use is not the highest power laser for this on the market. You can get um, only. Almost an order of magnitude more power if you want to. Okay. But this laser power can paint this beam size. I mean, you want to make the beam not too small, like otherwise it gets hard to control. So there's a compromise between how small do you want to make your beam, how much power you have, and so on. That, and then also another limitation, I should say, if you really want to increase the Rabi frequency further than that, you need to think very careful about optical switching. Um, so that's already quite challenging. This is actually tuned down on purpose to six megahertz because the um, the switching dynamics with an acoustic optical modulator, um, the time scale for switching a laser beam becomes comparable to the Rabi frequency, which is maybe uh, a good a good thing. Like that, we're that fast, but it also makes the control a little bit harder. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Questions about that? All right. Let me let me move forward. So um. So what about interactions and engineering entanglement? The simplest thing you can study is two atom or two qubit interactions and you try to engineer an entangled state there. What do you do? You basically rearrange atoms into pairs of atoms that have a, a close distance uh, within each pair and then the pairs are non-interacting. Then again, this pair physics I kind of showed earlier already. So you have basically four states at uh, large distances is non-interacting. So you can drive these Rabi frequencies and then at uh, very close distances, the excitation pathway to this double excited state gets blocked. And this is called the so-called Rydberg blockade as a famous a famous mechanism that has been known for many years. And we implemented this uh, for the first time with alkaline earth atoms. And then um, what happens in that situation is that in, in the ideal limit, you get a Rabi oscillation between this state where both atoms are in the ground state and then in a superposition state with a single uh, a rootback uh, excitation, but you don't know which atom has the rootback excitation. This basically generates a so-called Bell state. So it's a two atom entangled state. And then um, um, if you go through the three a little bit more detail, you would also see that the Rabi frequency should be enhanced by a factor of square root two. So we see this in, in all its glory in experiments. So we see very nice uh, so-called block, uh, block, uh, blockade oscillations where uh, we see the square root of two enhancement. We see also excitation basically between this manifold and this manifold with very high contrast. Um, we see this for very long times, in this case, up to 60 oscillations. So these are basically entangling and disentangling oscillations done 60 times. So again, this is the first time we did this alkaline earth atom uh, blockade basically. And then um, we have some 
um, schemes for actually reading out the fidelities. Um, if you think about what's the preparation fidelity for this Penn State, we see about 98% if you don't correct for preparation and, and, and measurement errors and, and somewhat above 99 if you correct for uh, state preparation measurement errors, so called spam errors. So this is um, quite a bit higher than has been demonstrated before. And, and um, maybe now there's also results where, which are this close, um, and, but to my knowledge not published. Okay. All right, so this is uh, important. It's important to have these high fidelities. Again, if I really want to go into like, high, high fidelity quantum simulation, and then also if I want to make gates or maybe I want to engineer entanglement for metrological applications. Okay, questions about that? I'll move to many body physics. All right. So we took these fidelities and then last year around that time um, started to play basically with many body, with many body physics. And this was before COVID hit, maybe we had like two months, then COVID came and then we played with theory for a while and then went back to it. And I wanna show some of the results we acquired in that in that, uh, in that that last year. Basically. We, we do have a question. Yes, please. Hi, uh, what, what limits your um, Bell State fidelity? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I think at the time we did not know. I think by now we might know. Um, we think it is in fact not a decoherence mechanism per se, but um, imperfect blockade in that case. Um, so, so our most recent uh, modeling of that, I come back to modeling in, in a minute actually. We have extremely detailed models now for this system. So this most recent model indicates that it has to do with the fact um, that this thing is not completely blocked. So in, in essence, the Rabi frequency compared to that interaction shift is not infinite. It's finite and that limits this Bell state fidelity. And um, this recent model indicates it's a model. Um, I don't know if you can actually do it, but this model indicates that you could relatively easily go to nine, three nines or even higher. But just repeating this with like a little bit different parameters. Uh, this we did not understand at the time, I should say. So, so just in terms of what we think we have as coherence mechanisms, and I think we understand this pretty well, um, we could get go above nines probably relatively easily if we tried hard. Maybe. But it's it's like a, a relatively short term, I think, prospect. Good question. Yeah. So we think it's it's residual interaction, not really um, decoherence or dephasing, which is the uh, dominant source of error. However, I have no proof for that. I only have a model. So I'd like to really prove that I would have to try it out, which we haven't done yet. More questions? Yeah, so, so in principle, just from the atomic physics, you should be able to push this to at least three nines, probably four nines, if you, if you push really hard. There's no fundamental reason why you couldn't be um, close to four nines. It's just hard to do in practice. <laughs> Okay, good. All right, so let me let me move forward. Actually, all right, maybe we can at least get some of it in at uh, what we call many body benchmarking. Um, so so we started to do quantum simulation experiments again using this Hamiltonian. So we do rearrangement um, up to sixty atoms in one D. We're working towards two D now. And the easiest experiment you can do is you start with all atoms in their ground state and you just quench it with that Hamiltonian. And uh, that means you just switch on the Hamiltonian and see what dynamics happens. And you can, interestingly enough, tune this Hamiltonian to various different parameter regime. So something that has not been done before, where we have unpublished results on, you can tune it basically close to integrability. So you can study integrable many body dynamics and you see a characteristic light cone spreading, for example, here in the experiment. So there's a two point correlation function that propagate as a function of space time. And you see a nice match between experiment and simulation. Uh, mostly we have worked with this Hamiltonian, what we call a generic chaotic regime. So you can tune it somewhere where it basically realizes many body uh, quantum chaotic evolution. And then this was one of the earlier data sets we took for that, um, where you see that the experimental data points here, they follow very nicely um, a, a numerical simulation that has no, um, no decoherence effects. And that's just really the, the pure uh, simulation that you have. And then it all thermalizes coherently to, to some sort of steady state value. So this is a really nice demonstration of uh, what is called quantum thermalization. So in all of these cases, we saw relatively early on that we actually kind of, in terms of 
matching um, theory results, we kind of have it under control. So we see very nice agreement between our numerical predictions and what I would call few body observables. So this is an on-site magnetization or a two qubit correlation function. But um, we, we wanted to go a step further and really ask um, some sort of a, a question that's, that's rarely asked in quantum simulation, unfortunately. And uh, we, we thought it's important to do that, which is what is really your many body fidelity? So how good are you actually in preparing a certain target state? So you do this quantum simulation experiments where you drive the system with a Hamiltonian. So what do you actually get now? So what do we actually know about how close we are um, to what we ideally want to simulate? And this is really a question of, can we measure the many body fidelity? This is a question that's more often asked in quantum computing um, uh, applications. And we wanted to somehow try to do that really with, with on the many body side with, with quantum simulators. And, and let me let me kind of detail in a minute what I mean with that. So in theory, I'm, I'm trying to do something that produces a certain quantum state psi in experiment. Uh, and that's my theory for it in experiment. What I have is not that state, I have some other state rho, which is a mixed state, and that mixed state you get because you have errors in the experiment. Now the question is, how close am I to my actual target state? And this is measured by the so-called many body fidelity. It's just the overlap between psi and rho, essentially. And this thing goes from zero to one. If I'm at one, I did the right thing. If I'm at zero, I did uh, something wrong. And um, so can you measure that in experiment? Yeah, you can measure it for small systems. If you have arbitrarily single side rotation and read out, you can just do state tomography. So you basically reconstruct that state that you get and then just in theory, just calculate that over there. For larger systems, you cannot do that because state tomography scales um, exponentially with system size with, uh, with quite a strong exponent. Um, and often in experiment, you don't have readout in, in all bases. And also it's, it's quite, quite an experimental overhead to, to implement that. So, and there's one um, possible solution to that or one solution um, to, to solving that problem, which is to utilize quantum chaos. And let me kind of illustrate what I mean with that. If you have chaotic evolution, an error can have a, like a, a tremendous effect basically on your output uh, statistics of the experiment. And uh, what do I mean with this now? We measure everything only in a single basis. So I make measurements only in sigma C. That means every qubit that I have at the end of my evolution, I either find a zero or a one. So I find it in upstate or in ground state. And um, so basically I get like two to the end measurement results out for like um, every, every qubit could be down, every qubit could be up, everything in between everything comes up with a certain probability. Um, and this probability has a certain distribution. So it's a multidimensional probability distribution with two to the n entries. It has a particular structure. We call this the measurement outcome histogram or bit string histogram. And uh, sometimes this particular structure is called a speckle pattern or bit string speckle pattern. And now what happens is if you have an error, if you have an error, um, this distribution between what is ideal so if I have no error, this is like what I would get ideally and in theory out. And if I have an error, distribution looks completely different. So the fact that you have these fluctuations and the fact that an error changes these fluctuations in a non-trivial way actually enables you to detect an error if you now look at correlations between these two output probability distributions. So in simplified terms, uh, the fidelity in chaotic evolution you could get from experiment theory output histogram correlations. Um, and this has been done in particular uh, in, in, in digital uh, uh, circuits, for example, using a so-called linear cross entropy. So this is a formula where you correlate these probability distributions between um, uh, the ideal case, which is P0 of C. So P0 of C is just these entries here as a function of C, which is the bit string. And you correlate it with what you get in experiment with specific prefactors. And then under certain conditions, um, this gives you the fidelity, this many body fidelity. So this has been done. Um, for digital circuits, and you can look up, for example, Google's work, uh, where they use this linear cross entropy in their supremacy paper in particular. And then IBM has their own version. It's called heavy output distribution test. So there's a few different variants of that. But they all work more or less via the same scheme. And we thought of, okay, can we try to apply this to analog quantum simulators? And it's not completely trivial, because if you look at this formula, you if you start working it, you see right from the scratch that it doesn't really work. And then uh, we came up with a new fidelity estimator um, that has actually quite a lot of physics in it. I don't want to explain the formula in detail. It's essentially similar to linear cross entropy, but it like um, divides out in a particular form. And this is, again, a correlation function between these output probability distributions. We applied this. Um, a fidelity estimator now in our quantum simulation platform to estimate the fidelity that we have as a function of evolution time for 
Uh, this is here for 10 qubit system under chaotic evolution. Let me walk you through that graph. So x axis is the evolution time. So we just range with the Hamiltonian and then we do fidelity estimation here. Um, so the uh, gray dots are the experimentally uh, the estimated fidelity of the experiment. And then we compare this uh, to an up initial error model. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that we have very good modeling of the experiment now um, based on measuring all kinds of error sources. And then we model basically a noisy experimental state that we compare to a target state. And this is what we would expect from the, so this is what we'd experiment, what we expect for FC, this fidelity estimator in experiment, this is what we predict is not fitted. This is just up initial. So we just calibrate everything and just predict that. And now for this error model, we can also plot the true fidelity. The true fidelity is this dashed line. And you see in particular that this FC, this is the estimator, estimates the true fidelity well up to some, some noise that actually comes from finite size. Um, um, so this is this is good. So we see that in the regime that we are with our types of noise sources and so on, this fidelity estimation works. And we also see that we can predict the fidelity of the ex experiment on a many body level now uh, using knowledge of our noise sources, which is actually quite remarkable. There's not that many cases I know of. Maybe not, maybe they're the only one, I don't know, but there's not, it's not so easy to do many body fidelity a prediction in a way from from up initial measurement of noise sources. So this is nice. So there's there's two things that are important here. So it works now. This fidelity estimation works for uh, Hamiltonian evolution, and um, we see actually pretty highly competitive fidelities. You see this uh, when you compare the fidelity uh, at the time where the entanglement basically is maximized. So this is the half chain entanglement entropy. There's a certain time scale you need again for build up. This is what I showed very early on. The time scale here is about half a microsecond. At that time where the system basically becomes fully entangled, um, we have a fidelity close to one on the many body level for 10 qubits, which is um, highly competitive. If you want to do reach the same thing, say with a random circuit, a digital circuit, you need close to three nines in, in, uh, in two qubit uh, and, uh, fidelities, which is actually not possible right now. So this is uh, relatively, it's really, really promising. Now we can try to scale this up to go to large systems and see what we can do with that. Um, there's one interesting part of this. I'm running out of time a little bit. I'm not sure, Dave, how much time I have, but uh, um, maybe, yeah, let me talk about this briefly. So this part um, is, is interesting now because making this kind of match to actually see that my experiment and theory overlap is that high requires that I know my parameters and experiment extremely well. So um, the fidelity estimation depends highly sensitively on uh, which Hamiltonian parameters I have in the experiment. And if these experimental parameters um, match what I use for my theory prediction. And in particular, you can use this now to figure out what I actually had in the experiment. So to go kind of backwards. And to this end, you parameterize your target state um, uh, that that you get um, with, and you evolve it with a Hamiltonian that you parameterize, for example, with this Rabi frequency omega. So I basically generate multiple target states, and then I estimate the fidelity for multiple target states in, in post-processing. So I keep the experiment the same, and just in post-processing, I check, okay, I generate different targets that using different Hamiltonians, and then I check for which of these do I get the highest fidelity over that. And to this end, we just integrate basically this fidelity curve. In particular, when you when you use the wrong parameters, actually the fidelity decay is extremely quick. So that means if you just integrate the curve, you will see a maximum, basically, it's kind of the lifetime of that thing that you see. You see a maximum when you match the correct parameter that you have in experiment. And um, so you see extremely sharp peaks, for example, here for all of these parameters. This is omega. Um, delta, this is the, the, uh, the light shift, uh, not the light shift, this is the detuning, and including the C6 coefficient. That's really kind of a weird way of measuring atomic physics quantity is to measure it via this many body fidelity overlap. So we can just vary this in theory and we get out really what we expect is the, is the right C6 coefficient. Um, now this is really a, a new way for parameter estimation. So these are classical parameters in the Hamiltonian that are estimate via many body fidelity overlap. And I find this extremely interesting because it's very, very sensitive. You see here, like maybe I should put a different scale on top, but you see if you're um, not even a percent away, this drops by a factor of two. So you can really very, very sensitively figure out what the experiment is actually doing uh, in, in the many body machine. And you could use this, for example, to stabilize the experiment instead of doing dedicated calibration, which you normally do. It's actually quite complicated. So you measure all these single like classical parameters all the time and you kind of try to stabilize them. And um, you could do this just by many body fidelity overlap if you want to. And there's an open question associated with this. 
I can basically in this post-processing measure all parameters. I can vary all omegas that are site resolved and tentas that are site resolved and all the C6 coefficients in, uh, independently. That means it's, it's intrinsically a multi-parameter estimation. And there's a question um, whether this multi-parameter estimation already has what we call a metrological advantage, um, a quantum advantage um, in, 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 in terms of how precisely I can estimate these things compared to classical measurements. Because this state that we use here, this many body state at late times is extremely highly entangled. It's more entangled than what you would usually even use in, in metrology applications. So that's something quite interested in understanding. Okay. Um, uh, before I wrap this up, let me say something I still also find quite quite remarkable, which is that um, this fidelity estimation now also works for random circuits. So I showed it only for Hamiltonians, but we showed it also for random circuits of the type that Google or IBM are implementing in, in there. In their in their work, so uh, here you see the fidelity estimates the true the estimation uh, estimates the true fidelity correctly here, and then we compare this then um, to typical formulas that are used, for example linear cross entropy by Google. And what you see is that this fidelity estimator works for much shorter times or for much shorter shallower depth than Google's formula. And um, this is actually quite surprising because if you try to understand these um, est estimators carefully. These guys, they actually depend on the system globally being extremely chaotic. So it takes a certain time scale for basically the system to scramble and to build up entanglement and correlations to actually measure these things correctly. And surprisingly enough, this fidelity estimator that we have works at extremely short time scale. And this works, as mentioned, for digital circuits and for Hamiltonian at very short time scales. And um, I should say that this is somewhat surprising. And um, so we guessed this fidelity estimator relatively early on. We can basically play with that, but we never really fully understood why it works. So we see this and it's kind of a little bit puzzling and it took us a while um, to figure this out. And this uh, brought us to um, something that is probably more important in than this fidelity estimation, which we call emergent randomness. So there's a specific reason why this fidelity estimation works. And uh, I, I think that's relatively fundamental. Let me briefly tell you what I mean with this. So, um, so, so we can observe this phenomena experiment and I first wanna show you the data before I show you the theory. So the idea is here, you, again, you do a quench experiment in, in a chaotic evolution, and then you look at, at results from a subsystem. And then the first results I wanna show you is a subsystem that I choose just to be a single qubit. And I use, a, I use results that are not just of the subsystem, but they're correlated with the rest of the system. So normally, if you look at these quench dynamics, you would look at, for example, local magnetization. Uh, that's not what we do here. We do something more complicated. We look at measurement results in that subsystem conditional on finding a certain measurement results in the rest of the system. So for example, we can look at the probability of observing a spin in a, a, a or qubit in a certain state conditional on finding all the other spins in the different states. And you have two to the n minus one different curves, basically, or two to the n minus one uh, results in the complement for my local system. And you can look at these curves, for example, as a function of time. In the beginning, um, all of my results kind of follow the same time curve, but then they kind of disperse into some pretty chaotic evolution. And again, these curves are probabilities of finding a single qubit in a certain state, depending on what the other states are. And then each curve is, basically for a different measurement result on, on the other states. And then you can here um, uh, do, uh, basically you can analyze this in more detail by creating histograms of, of, of these probabilities over all the uh, external bit string configurations. And then if you do this at late time, you find a histogram that's basically flat. So these are these experimental uh, results. And these flat histograms are extremely peculiar. Normally you don't get flat histograms like that. Usually you get spiky histograms actually. And um, and then you can think about like, where can such a flat histogram actually come from? And then some sort of one explanation is, the flat histogram you get if I take a single qubit uh, pure state ensemble. So I, I, I basically, um, sample single qubit states that I just plot on the block sphere. And then I check the output probability distribution, the probability of probabilities in a way to find the single qubit state in a certain uh, in a certain configuration. And if I do that, I get this, uh, this black line here. So I get this flat distribution. So it looks like um, somehow these results come as if I dialed in just random configuration of a single qubit state that's completely random. And in particular, this uniform distribution of having um, qubits uniformly distributed on a block sphere 
uh, on, on a single qubit uh, space is called, uh, generally speaking for all spaces, is called a so-called Haar random distribution. Now, this is for a single qubit subsystem. We see the same thing for larger subsystems uh, where this output um, distributions follow this Haar random predictions to the dot almost. So this again, universal prediction is just some formula dialing. There's nothing fitted. This is just experimental data that basically fits this output distribution. Um, you can look at this in, in more detail by analyzing moments of the distribution and you find that these moments again follow this Haar random distribution. Um, this, uh, typically you get K factorials out. So there's two factorial, three factorial, four factorial. And this happens for all kinds of subsystem choices then I can make. So there's universally in the system, you find like a four factorial. I never thought I would measure four factorial in that system, but it just comes out universally basically. Um, you can look at even more complicated um, um, observables, like, like two point correlation functions and you would see numbers like a square root of four over 35. So universally you get basically um, results out that look like as if um, your measurement results, these conditional observables associated with subsystem appear as if they stem from a completely random ensemble of quantum states. And that's quite remarkable actually. And this and universally comes out in this, in this dynamics if you do the measurements very carefully and you, you look at these correlations in the right way. And this is not predicted by any existing theory framework to our knowledge. So in particular standard quantum thermalization like um, knowledge would not tell you that something like this should happen. Um, so why does it happen? And so what's really the theory framework now? It's kind of the last thing uh, I'll talk about in detail is, is this. So you can take any quantum state in a, in a large, larger Hilbert space, say you have a quantum state of n qubits and then the bipartition the system into a subsystem B and a subsystem A. Say A is my system of interest. And then normally what you would do in, in these many body studies, you would just forget about B and just check what are your properties of A. But it's not what we're doing. We again, we correlate systems and uh, uh, results in A on what happens in B. And what generally what you can do is for each measurement result you get in B, for each bit string configuration in B, you can define a new quantum state for A. It's a so-called conditional state. So this is like kind of like a filter type measurement. You measure, I run the experiment and make a partial measurement here. And then I continue in that part. And I can ask, okay, what is the quantum state of A after I found something in B? And again, now I have two to the N minus L, where L is the number of these qubits, possibilities of making a measurement here. So there's an extremely large number of bit strings that can come out in B. And for each of these bit strings, I get a new quantum state that I can define. And we call these quantum states uh, conditional states. So there's a psi depending on what CB is, okay? And now this, this uh, conditional state, they form a pure state ensemble that lives on subsystem A, okay? This pure state ensemble consists of all the states and the probabilities of observing that state. So there's a certain probability I get a bit string configuration in the rest of the system. And again, there's exponentially many of these pure states in A. And this is strictly speaking a more general um, description of a subsystem A than what you normally would do with a so-called reduced density operator. It's a standard approach as you would trace this thing out. And then you get um, uh, only results for A. We look at these results more generally in terms of correlations between A and B. That's, that's really the difference. Um, and now our results um, that we found theoretically, I don't have time to go into detail, the results that we found theoretically is that this ensemble here takes on a close to high random distribution. So it's close to randomly distributed in, this, in the subspace of A after generic chaotic evolution. So it's really a phenomena of emergent randomness. And um, it is, in a sense, more general than what you would think of quantum thermalization. So if you have this, this implies that you thermalize locally, um, but not the other way around. So actually this is this is more general. So far we know this only, I should say, for its effective infinite temperature. So we are working on generalizations of this now. Um, this um, uh, emergent randomness explains why this um, uh, benchmarking formula works so well. So in particular, um, if you have an error that happens in the system now and it hits that subsystem where you have this emergent randomness, it basically screws up that random distribution in a way that is detectable. And in particular, um, the fact that this emergent randomness happens locally at very early time scales explains why this fidelity estimation formula works uh, for such early, early time scales. Um, there's a lot of open questions in that. Let me just highlight one, which is, okay, so we use this for what is called effective infinite temperatures. That means that if I looked at this subsystem and I would define a reduced density operator, this would be a, so a canonical ensemble at infinite temperature. Uh, we are working currently at 
on generalizations um, of, of that to finite temperatures, and we think we'll, we'll find these. And it's actually quite exciting because if that actually works out, it's, it's almost like a generalization of quantum statistical mechanics in a way. Where normally you look at canonical ensembles or like, uh, grand canonical ensembles and these things, but they are basically mixed states, right? If I write down a canonical ensemble, it's e to the minus beta h. It's a mixed state over energy ix states. Here we define basically ensembles via pure state ensembles that have a random shape. And, and from these pure state ensembles, if you collapse them, we would get the mixed state. So some sort of a general, more general object um, that describes um, higher order observables that come when you take out, when you take into account um, results from a bath. Um, that being said, uh, like, after I learned this, I somehow I, I look around in my environment and I'm starting to see these random ensembles everywhere. Maybe I'm going a little crazy, but I think it's probably true that probably this form of randomness exists everywhere around us in a way. So if you started to measure an environment correctly, you would actually recover at least partially the structure of randomness. So it's probably a very, very fundamental thing that we somehow almost like stumbled across there. Um, I should say, um, a lot of the credit for this should go to Sun Won Choi, who worked with us on that um, for a long time now, for more than a year, and we worked in a very intense collaboration over the last year. And a lot of these theory ideas are really, really for him. So originated in work with Fernando a long time ago, but really Sun Won um, was the driving force for this uh, at the theory. Okay. Let me uh, wrap up here with the last outlook on metrology. So I never told you how we make it into this metastable state for Rydberg excitation. And to this end, we really just drive this clock transition in, in Stromsi in the same way they drive this in an optical atomic clocks. And um, so, so we use this in, in, in the many body system just as a preparation step. So we just go from this ground state to the metastable state and then forget about the ground state. And, and we can do this with relatively high transfer fidelity. But in principle, this transition, we kind of overdrive it for that. But in principle, you can drive this transition um, very weakly, such that you really start to see the line width maybe of this thing. So and the question is, okay, how, how minimal can you actually make this line width? And if you can make it very narrow, can you actually build an optical clock out of this, similar to what you did in an in a, in optical lattice? And we did that um, um, around, around 2019. And I would also really highlight the work by Adam Kaufman, who really kind of pushed this like to new extremes also, um, which is basically you, you interrogate this, this, this clock state transition, and then you take single atom measurements and basically feedback it onto a, a high uh, a ultra narrow laser system. And you stabilize this laser system. And once you do the stability loop and uh, the stabilization loop, basically this clock system, uh, clock laser system uh, stabilized to the atom defines basically a frequency standard. And then the interesting part here is that this merges in a way um, this programmable single site control up here that was done with up to 80 tweezers with very, very high precision measurements. So what you see here is an optical signal. So that's a, a, a signal at like close to 700 nanometers or multiple hundreds of, of terahertz that we, that we can resolve uh, on, a, on a, a close to hertz level. Okay. And we can resolve it not just in a bulk of atoms, for, for each atom, for each tweezer, we can resolve it on the Hertz level. And I find this quite remarkable because it's some sort of like a, indicates a marriage in a way of, of precision measurements and really programmable quantum control for the first time. And I find this like very remarkable. It's, it's true, it happens in ion traps too. They do similar things, but they do it maybe with two qubits or with two atoms. Well, we can do this now maybe with hundreds of atoms, really program uh, the system and at the same time make this, make this precision measurements. And then one outlook is here really combining these things. So I showed you a lot of things about this Rydberg excitations and we use this for simulation, maybe optimization. Then I told you very briefly about this high precision clock control. And now you can think of really combining these things. I can, for example, use this Rydberg states to engineer inter entanglement on these optical clock transitions. Um, um, and maybe this entanglement, if you do it right, could help you to run the clock um, with higher stability. There's, there's known certain ideas for how to do this. And these are things that we're following up. Uh, at this moment as we speak. Um, okay, so with this, let me come to some sort of a summary. I showed you these early results with atom by atom assembly and some results for uh, alkali atoms on quantum simulation and entangled state engineering that I was part of. Um, we basically demonstrated the first results for arrays of alkaline earth atoms and narrow line cooling in tweezers. Uh, we showed record fidelity imaging for neutral atoms in that system. We engineered um, 
uh, rootback excitations for the first time in alkaline earth atoms, uh, also with record fidelities in the end. Uh, I showed you results for basically a new atomic clock platform, uh, what we call Twisa clock nowadays, which married like really like like builds on programmability and high precision measurement at the same time. And um, again, these things combine some sort of indicate that there might be a platform out there that's that's almost like a hybrid between a quantum computer and an atomic clock. That's some sort of what I'm getting at. So you could do something that's extremely high precision, uh, uh, like merged with programmable quantum control, including entanglement. And that's something that's actually quite exciting. I think. And then um, is in the immediate section, I also uh, talked about uh, basically how we can benchmark these systems now correctly, really at a many body level, again, some sort of a high precision approach in a way that we're trying to take, uh, really to benchmark everything correctly. And then as part of this benchmarking, um, um, uh, benchmarking work, we, we uncovered a phenomena um, that we call now emergent randomness. <laughs> and, and this emergent randomness, honestly, is the thing I think most of these days, because it's so fundamental and so exciting um, that we see this for the first time now. And there's so many open questions associated with that. Um, anyway, so these are the results. And now really coming back to longer term outlook based on what I showed very early on. So there's these many directions in quantum science, you know, from computing to networks and I showed you basically results that are somewhat in this first three categories, entangled state generation, you know, in com computing, we talked talk a bit about quantum simulation results, but sometimes when you do these measurements, like really carefully, you cover something new. And I think this emergent randomness is a good, a good example that was not even thought about before. And somehow if you do these things really, really right, and you look at them carefully, sometimes you see new things. And this was nice and, and good to see. I talked a little bit about like future directions in quantum metrology. We have some ideas for quantum networks uh, using individually controlled atoms that we developed together with Oscar Painter. This is a proposal down here. So the bottom line is to me that these, these assembled atomic arrays are very exciting and, and not just promising, but already to certainly create established platform, not just for one direction, but basically for all of these directions in quantum science, which is really exciting. Often you can do it even in the same platform. It's also even nicer from experimental point of view. I would also like to highlight that this is really early days. So like in 2016, around that time, we first started like to really showcase this, this atom by atom assembly and that it works. And then since then there have been a lot of results, but uh, really from an engineering level, these experiments are not engineered to death yet. So you can actually do it still in, in, the, in a university setting and there's a lot of open ground to be covered with new ideas. So it's actually quite different in terms of uh, level of engineering compared to say superconducting qubits or ion traps, for example. Um, and with this, you know, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And sorry for the overtime. Thank you, Manuel. Um, so I guess we'll open the floor for any questions. Sorry, this took longer. <laughs> Hard work. All right, so we've got Jason. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hey, Manuel, thanks for the uh, amazing talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the um, uh, fidelity optimization where you were backing out the Hamiltonian parameters. Yeah. Um, I wonder, I mean, how, how um, constraining is that? I, I was wondering if you, let's say, I think you had three parameters, but if you allowed yourself, you know, some yeah. natural ignorance yeah. of the Hamiltonian and, you know, dress it, yeah. dress it up with additional pieces, can you yeah. increase yeah. the fidelity even further? Yes, I should say the, the the plots we showed before, they don't even use that. So this is like, just to be clear. So we, um, um, these, these guys, we, we don't even use this. This is just more or less, we do a tiny bit of optimization, but like very minimal um, compared to the parameters we measure separately. So now it is true that in principle, for example, here I'm using a global omega, right? But I could make the site dependent too. And this you can do. And then what you uncover, for example, is there's a tiny bit of a gradient. Not mm -hmm. much, but you uncover a tiny bit of a gradient and it tells you exactly what is your Rabi frequency on each side. <laughs> and then if you take this into account, yeah, you can you can you know go a little bit higher. That's fine. So you could do that. We didn't want to push this too far because it's almost like like it almost feels like cheating. I don't think it's cheating. Um it's actually probably what it is. It's just like um seeing what you actually did. 
Um, but we want we wanted to mainly highlight there first that like what, what you intrinsically get. So like you also want to make sure that your other measurements like kind of make sense. And I should highlight maybe one thing is that in the beginning when we try to calibrate our parameters independently and we afterwards did that thing, we always had a mismatch. So we never understood why, for example, our detuning is off. It was always 50 kilohertz off or 100 kilohertz off. And it turned out that not this many body thing was always right. <laughs> I think it's just right mm -hmm. by definition almost. It turned out that our calibration scheme had a, had a problem. Like we overlook a certain subtlety in the calibration scheme we would have never found without that thing. So that's actually quite powerful, I think. So again, to answer your question, yes, I think you can push it further if you um, um, like, like, like drop constraints. So you make this site dependent and you make uh, site dependent positions. Then you could check, for example, if you actually have different terms in the in the Hamiltonian, right? I mean, the, the Hamiltonians are never 100% uh, precise. There's probably higher order terms you could uncover if you do it right. So it's actually, this one, this piece I found really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very neat. Thanks. A lot, a lot to be done. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Manuel, maybe I'll, I'll ask a somewhat yeah. real quick question. Which is you mentioned um, an ab initio calculation for this fidelity estimator. What is yeah. what is what does an ab initio calculation mean, and and uh, how do you incorporate yeah. how do you incorporate your noise into it? Yeah, so ab initio. I'm not sure if this is the right term. So it means in this case that we didn't fit it. I would say so. What we do is. Um, um, we do a pretty painful job. I'm sure if Adam or Johnny is there, they would tell you. We do a very, very painful job in trying to do complicated spectroscopic techniques uh, with one atom or two atom, and then we look at correlation spectroscopy, and we measure our lifetimes in different channels. So we measure all the lifetimes, all the noise we have, single atom noise, correlated noise. Uh, we measure our laser frequency spectrum and this kind of stuff. And then we throw it all into open system dynamics model. So that open system dynamics model is a many body model that really simulates the many body dynamics, taking into account spontaneous emission into different channels, taking into account like emission, the emission changes how you detect it. And we take into account laser noise in a specific fashion and this kind of things. And we take into account atomic motion like like discretization, like not discret noise on that like atomic position and all these things. We measure that independently. We know how cold we are. That tells you, okay, how much do I fluctuate in terms of atomic position? It tells you how much Doppler shift I get. So we throw this all in in this model. This model is very complicated. It's not just the standard uh, Markovian open system dynamics, actually highly non-Markovian, and you have to treat it with uh, uh, quantum jump basically. It's, it's a Monte Carlo wave function approach to, to, to simulate all this noise and stuff like this. This is things actually that we originally learned in the clock context. So we had like a, a while, I'm not sure he's on, um, developed a, a up initial model for the clock. Uh, that this is where we did it for the first time. So for example, we could predict our clock stability from scratch, which is also nice. So we had no open knowledge. We knew our laser noise. We knew the frequency. I could tell you how, how precise the clock is. And we kind of use that knowledge to really do it on a many body level. And with up initial, I mean then is that the noise sources are calibrated separately. So I did not just like move around. I, I let, let's increase spontaneous emission in, until this thing matches. We didn't do that. So this was actually a surprise. So we just calibrated everything and it comes out right. So that's nice. And it's not just that this curve is matched. It's actually true that even this output probability distribution, if you look now at these correlations and not between an ideal um, prediction and the experiment, but between our noisy prediction or noise model and the experiment, they actually stay flat. So that means that the output probability statistics actually is correctly described. It's a much stronger statement than matching the fidelity decay. The fidelity decay, I could match by accident, like if I'm lucky. This output probability distribution, you have to be, say, very lucky <laughs> to match it. It's like almost impossible to have it wrong. So that's quite remarkable. That being said, we can right now only do this for the small systems. If we look at the fidelity for much larger systems, it deviates a little bit, and this we don't completely understand. So there's certain noise sources that scale with system size in a way that we don't understand yet. Let's put it like that. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, well, I don't see any more 
hands. So speak now or, or hold forever hold your peace. I'll write them on it. Okay. Oh, there, there's a question from Chris. Go ahead. Chris, go ahead. Hi. Uh, what sort of control do you have over um, like uh, spatial control over the detuning? So if I want uh, to implement like site dependent uh, Z rotations or something. Yeah, so this uh, right now we don't have implemented. So in principle, you can do that um, by shining laser beams through the high resolution object is similar with this. Like basically you would add another tweezer array on top uh, that shifts, um, shifts the detuning. Um, in principle, um, you can do that. We haven't done it yet here. Um, Adam, my student, wants to do it every second day, and I, I keep on doing this. I get to something simpler first. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that that C C you can control uh, relatively easily to a certain degree. Um, side dependent omega is harder, but C. But that's in principle all you need. But yes, this has been done. So as, as we don't do it here yet, but for example, this early experiments I showed you. For bell state generation, they actually use a trick um, where we use site dependent C control. This is in a Harvard experiment. Um, it's this adiabatic preparation. If you look into this paper, if you're interested, um, it's uh, it's this one. Um, it's it's this this science paper down here. This actually has a has a trick where we use C dependent control such that an adiabatic sweep automatically gets you in the G C states. Thanks. Okay, um, Ash is a question. Go ahead. Hello, Manuel. Um, I wanted to ask, um, uh, can you give me a little bit more intuition as to the connection between your new fidelity estimator and the uh, local randomness uh, the, in the projected ensemble? Yeah, that is, uh, um, it's not so easy to see. And uh, let, let me go quickly there. So the fidelity estimator, that's maybe the question that you have. So if you look at the fidelity estimator, it doesn't even use um, conditional measurement results at all, actually. So this fidelity estimator on first glance, at least, this guy, um, this is a global, um, these are global uh, basically bit string probabilities, these guys, right? But however, if you basically um, rewrite these formulas over sums over conditional probabilities, then you see that basically the randomness in these conditional probabilities actually matter. So in a sense, this fidelity estimator, I'm not sure uh, how much of an expert you are, but this fidelity estimator here, you can rewrite it uh, as, as a sum over a linear cross entropy evaluated with conditional measurement results, actually. So you can rewrite it like that. So it's essentially linear cross entropy, but like ev evaluated for each, um, conditional probability distribution. And then you sum over all external bit strings. So it's linear cross entropy basically locally. So if you have an, an error then that is just in, the, in this local subsystem, then you get linear cross entropy two to the N minus L times basically averaged over. So you can just look at the formula. It's in, it's in our paper in the appendix actually the calculation. It's relatively neat calculation. Um, so you basically expand it like that. And then you can um, use a bunch of tricks um, um, so if you're a little bit expert, so you can use a bunch of tricks that this, um, then if you know um, that locally, um, where is it? Yeah, it is. Uh, that locally this ensemble forms a two design, um, you can basically carry out the calculation exactly. So then you can basically look, use this kind of swap operator tricks um, uh, to do it. Intuitively, it's just that, um, uh, really this, this kind of random structure as is already like shown in, in Google's paper, essentially, if you have an error that hits this kind of random structure, it is basically destructive in a way such that it's gone. Um, and, and, and you can, then you see it essentially immediately. So it's like, if you have an error and, and an error propagates and it hits some sort of a state, these things and, and then this random ensemble, and then you basically see that this random structure is destroyed. And, and uh, in, in a way, it's not completely true that it's destroyed, but it's like uh, non perturbative to this to the random structure. And this, this effect you can basically see. So whenever you have an error, actually, in a, in a way, this cross entry, this, this FC becomes zero. Actually. And the fidelity is just what's your probability for having an error? That's some sort of the intuition. But this, this, if you're interested, this calculation is in our method section for the paper. And it's like a 10 liner, it's, it's a really cute calculation, actually.
but you need to know that it's random. So if you don't know it's locally random, then the calculation makes no sense. So this emergent randomness is really at the heart of it anyway. Otherwise you wouldn't, wouldn't know why this fidelity estimation formula should work. That's at least what we understand. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, um, well, uh, if there are no more questions, um, let me just, uh, on behalf of all the attendees, thank Manuel again, and especially for staying with us for uh, extended hour. Thank you. thank you so much, everyone. Okay, bye everybody. Bye.